Well, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I, was, I was told, I thought that they were kidding when they said it doesn't rain up here, and I, it's true. It's just every... <laughs> Uh, had a great morning. I was able to meet with our uh, alumni group and and our president's uh, advisory group, and, and here we are this morning going to have a, a tremendous uh, session, and um, uh, I know that I'm going to learn a lot, and, and uh, the fact that we have uh, two very successful alum here leading the way is uh, something that, of course, we can all be proud of. Uh, for those who were not at th uh, the amazing dinner last night, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Kent McDonald, and uh, I have the real honor of serving and leading, asked to lead Northwood University as the sixth president. So uh, one of the roles in this um, honor is hosting this event on, on Saturday morning, so uh, I'm happy to, to do so. Um, a welcome again to the annual Bay Harbor Symposium brought to you by Northwood University's Robert and Janice McNair Center for the Advancement a free enterprise and entrepreneurship. And Northwood University established this center in 2015, in September. It's a think tank focused on the advocacy and expansion of the free market and the creation and cultivation of entrepreneurs, something that we dearly need. The McNair Center was made possible by a generous gift from Robert and Janice McNair uh, who are perfect examples of how entrepreneurship and free enterprise system generates jobs, changes lives, and literally charts a new course for individuals and families and, and their entire communities. The Northwood McNair Center is dedicated to carrying out the McNair's vision for awakening a new generation of entrepreneurs while defending the moral and the ethical underpinnings of the American competitive free market and free enterprise system. The purpose of this morning, if you've not attended one of these events in the past, is to feature a timely and interesting topic and, and to give you just an inside look and glimpse into the economic outlook our economists review monthly. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce to you our guest speakers, and as I said, both are Northwood alum. First, I'd like to welcome Northwood alumnus Jonathan Williams uh, to the stage. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan was on campus earlier this spring and is, is uh, coming back on campus uh, this, this week. So, uh, and he also had some time hanging out in my old town of Ottawa recently. So it's really <laughs> good to meet you, uh, Jonathan. We're proud of you. Jonathan is a chief economist and vice president for the Center for State Fiscal Reform at the American Legislative Ex Exchange Council, ALEC, where he works to develop fiscal policy solutions for the states. In addition, Jonathan is the co-author of the annual Rich States, Four states, the Alec Lafer Economic State Competitive Index, with fellow economist Arthur La Lafer, Laf 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 excuse me, and Stephen Moore. Jonathan is a graduate of Northwood University, where he received his Bachelor of Business Administration in Banking and Finance, Economics and Business Management. He is also a contributing author of Northwood University's 10th Annual Defense of Capitalism, which we received last night. Leading the discussion today is the director of Northwood's McNair Center and Northwood's own Dr. Timothy Nash, my colleague. Tim Nash joined Northwood in 1980 and received a BBA from the university, a mass, an MA in economics from Central Michigan University, and a doctorate from Wayne State University. He's the author of Northwood's McNair Center for the Advancement of Free Enterprise and Entrepreneurship and the David E. Fry Endowed Chair in Free Market Economics at the University. Dr. Nash leads special, specialty programs, research, and continuing and executive education programming for Northwood University system-wide. 
Dr. Nash is also an adjunct scholar with the uh, Mackinac Center. I'm trying to not put on my glasses over there. <laughs> <laughs> a reminder, 18 font, not 16 font next time. <laughs> <laughs> I was good before I came here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Nash is an adjunct scholar with the Mackinac Center for Public Policy in Midland an adjunct scholar with the American Legislative Exchange Council in Washington, D.C. And he's also the former state director of economic education for the clergy for the state of Michigan. Dr. Nash has also authored four books, including When We Are Free, with a foreword by Dr. Milton Friedman, a book that I read this summer. It was brilliant. Uh, thanks, Tim. And 10 volumes of In Defense of Capitalism, he and his colleagues have conducted research and consulting for a number of Fortune 500 companies and their organizations, including the GM UAW program, programming, the National Automotive, uh, Automobile Dealers Association, the Motor and Equipment Manufacturers Association, the Automotive Aftermark Industry Association, the Michigan Chamber of Commerce Foundation, Chrysler, and Dow Corning Corporation. We have two brilliant economist with us this morning, and it's my pleasure to begin by welcoming my colleague and friend, Dr. Tim Nash. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for our new president, Dr. Kent McDonald. <laughs> yeah. It's been an honor and a privilege to get to know Kent and Mary Ellen and, and his family over the last couple of months. And one of the things that you may not know, some of us that are students of yore at Northwood University, uh, we had a, a brilliant teacher named Dr. V. Orville Watts. And Dr. Watts is the, um, the author of The Northwood Idea, our belief in free enterprise and, and free markets. And uh, he, for those that don't know, he was one of the founding members of the Mont Pelerin Society with Dr. Milton Friedman and Dr. Friedrich von Hayek, Nobel Prize winners in economics. And at the end of World War II, Dr. Watts and this other, this band of brilliant scholars met in Mont, uh, Mont Pelerin, Switzerland, founded the Mont Pelerin Society and established the framework to help prevent Europe from going completely socialistic and reversing that trend that was um, starting to take place in the United States. And so Dr. Watts is a brilliant scholar and a, a person that is near and dear to me and a lot of my fellow alums in the classroom and people in general. But I bring it up with regard to Kent because Kent is now the second great scholar of the Northwood idea from Canada because Dr. Watts was born in Manitoba, Canada. So we, we've got some great lineage there. And Coach Reckaway, I just want you to know that yesterday, uh, Dr. McDonald did pass out the words to O Canada. So at basketball games, we'll start off with the national anthem and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll end with, uh, with O Canada. So uh, always like that national anthem, Ken. Uh, it, uh, it is my honor to, to be here again for the symposium. And again, thank you all for being here. Uh, at uh, this early morning after a wonderful event honoring uh, Keith Pretty last night and, and Gretchen and really the whole Pretty family. I always uh, start out an event, and some of you may have heard this story before, but uh, not too many years ago I was the keynote speaker along with um, uh, the uh, president of NADA at the German Automotive Conference. And I remember going out to dinner with the the chief economist the night before the symposium started, and she's just this brilliant lady, brilliant economist, and she, she looks at me and she says, Tim, now tomorrow you're going to be opening up the program, so you need to start with a joke. And it should be something that really engages your talk and, and the audience, because you know we Germans have a great sense of humor. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, Claudia Fry has a great sense of humor, but in, in, in general, I'm not sure I'd say Germans have a great sense of humor. And, and she looks at me and she says, I have a great story for you. And I said, okay. So she says there's this economist and he's walking in the countryside outside of Frankfurt. And he, he walks down a road and he comes upon this farm. 
and the farm has this huge pen, and the pen is full of sheep. And so the economist, you know, being a quantitative guy, he's, he's looking at the pen, and he's in his mind estimating, well, how wide is the pen, and, you know, what's the depth of the pen, and, and then he's looking at the spacing between the, the sheep, and the farmer comes up to him and says, um, sir, what are you doing? And he says, I'm trying to uh, determine how many sheep you have in the pen. And he said, there's no way you can do that. He said, it's, it's too large, and there's the, the, the density of the sheep is too, is too great. And, and he says, no, no, I think I can do it. And the uh, farmer looks at him and says, son, if you can guess how many sheep are in that pen, I'll give you one to take home for dinner. So he says, all right. So he looks at it, and uh, he looks at it again, and finally he says, 946 sheep. Farmer looks at him, he's dumbfounded. He says, you're right. He says, uh, you know, pick one up and take it home. So the economist leans over, picks up an animal, and starts walking down the road. The farmer says, sir. The economist turns around, yes. He says, a double or nothing, I bet I can guess what you do for a living. The economist is thinking, mutton for two months now. <laughs> so he, he looks at the, uh, uh, the farmer and he says, game. And so the uh, economist says, what do I do for a living? And the farmer says, you're an economist. Now the economist is dumbfounded. And he looks at the uh, farmer and he says, well, how did you know I'm an economist? And he says, well, if you put my dog down, I'll tell you. <laughs> So the thing that's important, the, the, the thing that's important is numbers are, are key, but knowing what numbers are all about and what numbers mean is, is very important. So one of the things that Jonathan and I will do today is give you a lot of data, hopefully give you a little better viewpoint as to how things are going in the economy, and then leave it wide open for some good Q&A. Also, uh, if you want copies of my slides or Jonathan's slides or additional copies of, as, uh, as Kent referred to, our annual publication, In Defense of Capitalism, or Rich States, Poor States, we have some copies here. But if you want more copies, just note on your business card, we'd like to, the slides or we'd like uh, In Defense of Capitalism or our monthly economic outlook. Uh, we, we can put you on the mailing list to get that. So any of that that you want, just make sure I get your business card at the end of the presentation. And last but not least, the old professor in me says, just remember the only bad question is the question that you don't ask. So we won't uh, take offense to anything or uh, uh, any of the tough questions. We certainly won't shy away from them. Uh, so I, I always like to start this off with, uh, with a quote, and, and today's quote is by one of my all-time favorite economists, and as Kent noted, we were honored when Dr. Friedman uh, decided to write the foreword for our book, When We Are Free, which is really the, the book we use in our, our class regarding the Northwood idea. And Dr. Friedman was often quoted as saying, most fallacies derive from the tendency to assume that there is a fixed pie, that one party can gain only if the other party loses or at the expense of the other party. And when people feel that way, ladies and gentlemen, what you know automatically is they don't understand capitalism, they don't understand freedom and free enterprise. Because as Dr. Friedman and before Dr. Friedman, the great Adam Smith said, under a free and competitive economy, you can bake a bigger pie. You think about the wealth today. Imagine what the world was like in 1900 and look at what we have 100 years later. Who would have thought about cell phones or airplanes, jet transportation, just a few months ago, the, or not even a month ago, the anniversary of walking on the moon. All of these great things have happened because this world is far better and far wealthier. So one person's gain is not another person's loss because you can bake a bigger pie. You can expand the universe, the wealth of, of uh, the United States. But what's equally important is bad economic policy can cause wealth and the economic system to contract. So 
One of the things that we do every year, and uh, I'd personally like to thank uh, uh, the uh, good work of Bill Parlberg, who was president of the, uh, of the Chamber Board of the Michigan Chamber of Commerce. Quite a few years ago, he, he and uh, Rich Studley, the president of the Chamber, came to me and asked if we would be willing to do a research study looking at the economy of the state of Michigan. And so every year now, this year, we will release the eighth Michigan Competitiveness Study. And what they asked us to do was to rank Michigan against the other 47 states. And we started doing this in 2010 and 2011. And the state of Michigan uh, refers to the first decade, 2000 to 2010, of this millennium, of this century, as the lost decade. Michigan was the only state in the United States, ladies and gentlemen, that literally had a net loss of population. The state of Michigan was 50,000 fewer in terms of population in 2010 than it was in 2000. And so they asked us to put together a rather sophisticated mathematical model to rank Michigan versus the other 50 states. So we ended up, we got some professors from, now they're at the Citadel, Central Michigan, Rutgers University, and our own team from Northwood University. And we, we put together a, a model that's stood the test of time. And we ranked Michigan versus the other 49 states in things like GDP, economic growth, wage growth, tax level, new business startups, population migration. We had 200 variables in the model. And we called up Rich Studley and I got him on the phone and Rich said, all right, Timmy, where's Michigan out of the 50? I said, Rich, we're 47. Long silence on the phone. He said, you sure? I said, yes, sir. He said, how many times did you run the model? I said, 15. He said, could you run it one more time? I said, yes, sir. Called him back half an hour later. He says, where are we? We're 47. And he says, well, at least we're not 48, 49, or 50. But it's an interesting, it was an interesting time. It was an interesting analysis of the state of Michigan. I'm very pleased to point out that last year, Michigan was number 20. And this data goes from 2000 to date. So, you know, we're talking now nearly 20 years worth of data. And then we did a short term analysis of just the time frame of Governor Snyder. And Michigan, for that shorter time frame, was number eight in our model. And so it really, it really shows what an economy can do if business and the population decide to make a major difference. Rick Snyder, in my opinion, was one of the best governors uh, this state's ever had, and one of the best governors in the country. The state legislature rallied behind him, and they worked very well to make dramatic changes. And so what we do here is I present to you some data on the, the global, the US, and the Michigan economy, and give you a little hint of what we're going to release in September. The final numbers aren't in, so I can't tell you anyway, but I'll just give you a little hint as to where Michigan is right now. And then my, my dear friend and colleague, and um, what warms the heart of a professor the most is when you see a young mind do great things. And this, this young man to my right is, uh, is an incredible human being. He's a new papa. Um, I, I, one of the, my, my few regrets in life is that I didn't attend his wedding because my real son was getting married the same day. So uh, I wasn't able to be there, but... Uh, no we, excuse. No yeah, excuse. Yeah. <laughs> He's still bitter about it, but... Um, but anyway, he, he, is, he is just somebody that uh, I am and the university is so proud of. And Jonathan's then going to take a look at how Alec looks at states and, and uses their model to predict outcomes and the future outlook uh, in the economy. So without further ado, 
if you if you look at the uh, uh, so here's the the global economy as of uh, two weeks ago, and if you look at it, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, uh, the United States is the world's largest economy, and it's the world's largest economy. China is roughly two thirds the size of the United States. Uh, Japan is third. Germany is fourth. And one of the things that you're going to notice, and I think is really important when you look at the United States, but I'll make a lot of comparisons because what we don't realize and we don't, what we don't always appreciate is that some of our states are larger than some of the largest economies in the world. And one of the, the things that is always unique as a teaching tool, and David Fry and I saw this years ago, but an economist put a map of the United States together, and then instead of the state, they put what country the GDP was roughly the size of. And so we, we've done that uh, with our study, and you'll see where Michigan is in a moment. But the United States literally dwarfs uh, much of the world. China is rapidly gaining on the United States. But for example, the US is larger this year, slightly larger than the European Union. And so when you look at the size and scope, we were, at the end of World War II, roughly half the world's GDP. Today, we're just under 25% of the world's GDP, but it's a much bigger pie. And so a lot of these discussions that we'll have are relative uh, when, it, when you look at size and scope. So if you look at Michigan, i got to figure out where I'm pointing. Um, as you look at Michigan, uh, the Great Lakes region is a region, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that makes up five states, Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. And if you looked at those five states combined, those five states have the GDP of France. And in essence, the Great Lakes states combined would be the sixth largest economy in the world. Michigan's GDP would make Michigan the 24th largest economy in the world, or roughly the size of Belgium. If you look at uh, the United States, it's had a pretty good run in terms of GDP growth. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, we, we can debate and you, you listen to uh, the politicians that were gathered in Detroit a couple of days ago for the Democratic debates, there's a lot of interesting discussion about, you know, whose economy was better, the Trump economy or the Obama economy, and, and, and then uh, looking at, uh, you know, the Clinton economy versus, uh, say, the, one of the Bushes or the Reagan economies. And I think it's, it's all, it's important to look at, and probably the best single measurement is GDP growth. And so, if you look at um, where we are so far, you can see that um, under President uh, Obama, the economy grew real GDP, meaning discounted for inflation. The US economy grew at 1.9% during the eight years that President Obama was president. And it's grown at 2.63% under President Trump. In many ways, I'm a fan of President Trump but there are two things. Sometimes I just wish he would, would leave it at his first comment and not feel that he has to pontificate on certain things. And then secondarily, I, I wish he would stick to certain things and not try to predict GDP. You know, about four months ago he said GDP was going to be 4%. Um, I think that's um, what we used to say in Detroit, whistling through the graveyard. 4% uh, GDP in the next three or four years isn't going to happen, but, you know, we could get to 3%, and, and I, I don't think, I think he should talk strong economy. Things are going well, but if you look then at the economy, uh, just yesterday the uh, jobs figure came out, so we created 164,000 new jobs in the month of July. Unemployment's at 3.7% which is the lowest unemployment rate in just over 50 years. So uh, President Trump has a lot to be proud of there. Job growth, which has been very strong under the uh, Trump administration, is slowing. 
If you look at where we are at the end of July, we're, um, we're close to 1.2 million new jobs. And at this time last year, we were at, um, we were at roughly 1.5 uh, million new jobs. So job growth needs to pick up in order to, to be close to, to last year's figures. One thing that's been very, very promising under President Trump is the creation of manufacturing jobs. And, and I would say the same thing uh, regarding President uh, Obama when he said, manufacturing jobs will never come back and GDP growth isn't gonna be higher than about 2%. Again, I think that um, politicians need to dream more, create the policies for economic growth, and then just let it happen. Don't, you know, we economists, you know, the only people that make us look better are meteorologists. So, you know, we're, we're not real good at predicting, and if we're not, presidents probably should, should do the same thing. Um, and so as you look at this slide, here's an interesting analysis of, of uh, the U.S. economy. I remember my father, one of my uh, heroes who passed away a few years ago. He was just, um, you know, just, just one of the truly great human beings, a B-17 pilot in World War II. He was a you know, had nine kids, me in the middle, you know, you think all the things that he had to go through. But um, he gave me a, a copy of the Detroit News that I still have, which was a history of Detroit and why it was called the arsenal of democracy. Because Detroit was the place where most of the B-17s and, and uh, most of the tanks were produced in and around the city of Detroit. The auto and truck manufacturing industry was converted to produce the armaments of war and then afterward returned to the production of, of uh, uh, automobiles and trucks along with the great state of Ohio. Michigan and northern Ohio literally produced the vast majority of the, the armaments that turned the, the tide in World War II. The thing that's important to understand is that we are now just getting back to the level of manufacturing jobs in the United States today that we had in 1949. If you look at it, it was 12.88 million jobs and we're just a little bit under that. We've created over 400,000 new manufacturing jobs under, under President Trump. And, and so he's proven that American manufacturing has some resilience and the ability to grow. But simultaneously, I think it's important to note that Manufacturing jobs are never going to come back to the percentage of the American economy. If you look at this slide, over 30% of all jobs were manufacturing. Uh, today, I'd be surprised if we ever got to 10%. And there are two reasons. Think about what I said earlier. There are so many other things that we have that we produce, and many of them are not manufacturing. The service economy, computer programming, engineering, these are great jobs that, that don't have a direct impact on manufacturing. And then the second point, factories are so much more productive today. You know, I graduated from high school in 1976 and I worked uh, three summers in an automobile factory. And I've been back to some of those automobile factories and what I could do as a, I was called a fireman because I went from station to station and I would uh, relieve people for summer vacations. And what's amazing is an assembly line back then that made brake valves for Kelsey Hayes at the time that had 14 people on the assembly line, two people can do the exact same thing and produce three times as many brake valves as the old line did. So the, the, the key is that uh, manufacturing is very important, but a high order intellectual economy is, is really where we need to be. And so you know, we have an interesting balancing act in that, act in that regard. Now, now here's another, I think, impressive point. These are the jobs that are available in the United States by region. South leading the, the charge at 2.74 million, uh, the Midwest at 1.73. And, and if you go on and on, what you see is that there are 7.34 million jobs available in the United States. And the second point is, there's just under six million people unemployed. So if you look at this, we have almost 1.5 million jobs 
that we don't have people to fill. And there are two issues. One, we need to settle this debate on immigration and do it the right way because a lot of those jobs could be handled by a better immigration policy. And number two, and this is a real factor that we're not going to talk about in any detail today, but could certainly be another symposium that we would put in place. And that is that as you look at the, those numbers, part of it's our failing K through 12 education system. We spend more money on K through 12 education than just about any country in the world, maybe slightly behind Switzerland. But we rank 25th in math, science, and reading. If we are going to grow the economy, intellectual capital and a stronger K through 12 system is key. If you look at the same data measured after World War II, the United States was number two in math, science, and reading. So we, we have fallen relative to the rest of the world, and we need to do things better at the K through 12 education level. Uh, as you, as you take a look at uh, the next slide here, uh, it's important to note that um, uh, the conference board says that consumer confidence is up uh, dramatically versus last year. But one of the key indicators, the, uh, the um, Business Federation Small Business Confidence Index is down about the same. So the larger, broader consumer index is showing good things about the economy, but small businesses a little less confident uh, today than they were uh, uh, roughly a year ago. The uh, next slide oops, uh, shows the stock market. Uh, this is, we've had a couple of bad days, so this is off a little bit. Um, but the stock market, uh, uh, when we put this together two days ago, the, the stock market uh, was up uh, almost 17% for the year. And uh, that's a big improvement uh, over the stock market uh, in 2018. 2017 was a great year for the stock market. And, and, and overall, the stock market is up about 38% uh, since President Trump took office. So the stock market, if you believe that it's a leading indicator of the economy, uh, is still showing very strong signs uh, uh, of the economy doing well. Corporate profits, uh, the United States uh, hit record corporate profits in the third quarter of 2018. It's down a little bit in the first quarter of 2019, but it's dramatically higher than it was a year ago at this time. So U.S. corporations overall are doing well. And, uh, and when you think about profits, U.S. profits at 2.2%. $1 trillion, that T is a pretty big number. And you think about the fact that those are the profits of U.S. corporations, that's bigger than the GDP of most countries uh, around the world. And if you, if, you, um, if you think about it, here's a, you know, the, the, the second half of the slide, I always find these things to be interesting, but um, our highest quarterly profit in the history of the United States was third quarter 2018, as I noted. But look at what it was like versus 1951. In present dollars, we were the largest economy in the world, and our GDP, our profit per quarter for corporations, was uh, just under $15 billion. If you, you now this is kind of a teaser for our, our chamber study on the Michigan economy. Uh, Michigan in 2018, proud to say we were number four in the country in per capita GDP growth, that means per person adjusted for in inflation. When we put out our first study, if you want to go to the McNair website and take a look at it, we weren't, we weren't, uh, we were like 49th. And so we've made a dramatic improvement in per capita GDP. Uh, if you look at um, uh, the Michigan economy as it relates to this is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm one slide uh, behind. We are in real GDP overall, so the overall growth of GDP, we were number 14 last year, which again is a dramatic improvement. And then per capita GDP, we were at, four, we're at number four. So Michigan was 49th 
when we did our study a few years ago in overall GDP growth, and we were 48th in per capita GDP growth in 2010, 2011. So again, the state has shown extraordinary growth, and much of that has to do with, again, the business leadership of the chamber and other groups, and an incredible uh, uh, chamber of commerce and in the state legislature that uh, I would say, and I'll let Jonathan speak to it, but they're one of the best in the country. And one of the great leaders, the uh, Speaker of the House, couldn't be with us today, Lee Chatfield from this area. Lee is uh, from, literally, um, is from the Petoskey area and uh, is just one of the great state legislatures, legislators, not just in Michigan, but in the country. And I think uh, we're gonna hear more things from him uh, moving forward. Wage growth in Michigan has been strong. Uh, adjusted for inflation, it's in the top 15 nationally. And when you think about um, one of the truly big reasons why Michigan is doing so well, it has a lot to do with what's happening at the federal level. Uh, a lot of people were critical of President Trump's tax cuts. But if you look at the data that was released about a month ago, corporate income taxes revenue were down a little bit. Individual revenue, because of new job creation and more money in the pockets of individuals, you look at the balance of the two, and overall federal tax revenue from the tax cuts was up by almost a percent. So tax cuts do create more revenue. And I was even surprised. I was kind of doubtful that we'd get an overall net increase in revenue with the Trump tax cuts. <clears throat> but the thing that I think is really important is the problem is that states have a barometer and a governor. The federal government doesn't. And the reason why the deficit's gone up, and we'll look at that in a minute, is because the federal government dramatically increased spending. They got more revenue, but they had to increase spending by an even larger amount uh, than the revenue. One of the key reasons why Michigan has done so well is because of business climate. The business climate has dramatically improved, and that's largely due to the overall business climate and the corporate tax rate. Michigan had one of the most onerous tax systems in the country and one of the highest tax rates. And what you may not know about Governor Snyder, undergraduate degree in business, MBA in finance, Juris Doctorate in law, and he was the CEO of a couple of major corporations, including a venture capital firm and Gateway Computer before he came to be governor of Michigan. First thing he did was dramatically simplified our tax system and then cut the rate to the point where we are now uh, among the lowest corporate tax rates in the country. We're number 11 and uh, we're, we're number uh, 13 in terms of overall business climate as rated by the, uh, the Tax Foundation. All right, now let's talk about some interesting public policy issues that are being debated in Michigan. One of the things that we got a lot of press over is the fact that as you look at the, um, the state of Michigan, for all of our uh, automotive uh, people in the room, you know, Michigan for a long time has been considered the, uh, the home of the big three or the Detroit three. You know, we are the, the center of uh, uh, some major automobile manufacturing and corporate headquarters for some of the, the biggest and best known automotive brands in the world. So you'd think that we'd be a state that liked cars and made it easy for people to drive cars, but not in Michigan. We have the highest cost of driving an automobile in the United States. And we don't mess around. We're almost double the national average. And that's because we are one of the few states that has long-term disability and issues associated with uh, long-term care, pain and suffering. Uh, in Michigan, if you got into an automobile accident and you were the person that was at fault and you didn't have insurance, then the person that you hit, 
their insurance would be forced to cover your hospitalization and anybody in your car that was injured. So there, there are a lot of things that, that have happened. We're, we're, we've had the first wave of automobile insurance reform in Michigan about a month ago. We'll see what kind of a difference it makes. But this is as of a couple of months ago. Uh, Michigan is very costly. So, so think about how much more, this is just like a tax. If you're paying over $1,000 more to insure a car in Michigan, than you would in Ohio or you would in Maine or Massachusetts, that comes out of your bottom line. That, that is, in essence, like, like a tax. Now, if you recall when um, the, the debate for governor took place last fall, there was a real um, exchange and uh, you know, a, a bit of uh, uh, tempers or, or uh, a bit of emotion when uh, then Attorney General Bill Schuette accused our, our current governor, then the Democratic nominee, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, Governor Whitmer, that she would have the audacity to raise Michigan's gasoline taxes 20 cents a gallon. Uh, she told him on stage on the televised debate he was wrong, that that was ridiculous. She was interviewed in the newspapers the next day. She said, I would never do that. And so to some degree, she's a person of her honor. Her word is her bond because last month she said that uh, we need to raise gasoline taxes 45 cents a gallon. So everybody thought she was incensed that 20, per, 20 cents was too high, but right now we're, we're saying, hey, go big or go home, because we, we do need to figure out a way to finance our roads, but I think um, saying it should be 2.25% uh, higher than what you were being accused of is, is a problem. And think about what would happen. If this goes to 45 cents, then what you're saying is on every gallon of gasoline, if it goes to 45 cents, that 106 cents or a dollar six on every gallon of gasoline would go for taxes before you take out international taxes. That would be local, state, and federal, and a sales tax, because we have a sales tax on gasoline in Michigan. And so it'd be about 100, probably about 115 cents. So gasoline in Michigan, instead of being some of the best average prices in the country, would, would go up by at least a dollar and would, would curtail things. And again, the key is think about what it does to the least privileged economically. You know, gasoline becomes a big part of what a low income family has to pay to fill the car with gas, to get to work, to get home. And so it, it hurts the poor uh, disproportionately hard. Finally, for me, I can say to you that when we release our figures and our study next month, uh, the state of Michigan looks good. And all I'll tell you is that uh, the rank for the state of Michigan is gonna be a little bit better this year than it was last year. And again, I think that uh, the key is for Governor Whitmer, who is a good and decent human being, that hopefully she will work well with the Republican State House and State Senate and, and continue the growth for the state of Michigan. The worry that, that we have, and uh, Frank Beckman and uh, uh, Jonathan and I were talking yesterday on his radio show, and um, if you look at the national debt of the United States, even more interesting maybe than the slides you see up there. The United States national debt from 1776 to 1981, the end of uh, President Reagan's first year. So from the founding fathers to the end of President Reagan's first year in office was $988 billion. So it took us over 200 years to run up a one trillion dollar national debt. And we haven't messed around since then. And in our national debt today, as you can see, it, by the time President Reagan left office, it was 2.7 trillion. H.W. Uh, Bush, President Bush, 4.79 trillion, or I'm sorry, 4.19 trillion. Uh, President uh, Clinton actually did a very good job of uh, curtailing the debt and uh, you know, his was under six trillion. 
It almost doubled under President Bush. It almost doubled under President Obama. And unfortunately, at the current trend, uh, it, it will double under President Trump. And uh, so one of the things that um, you know, I'd love to entertain if you have any questions, but um, I um, am told by many people that I'm too much of a pie in the sky guy. But 49 out of our 50 states have a balanced budget amendment. By law, they have to balance the budget. And there are other things that work quite well for states that Jonathan's going to talk a little bit about. But something has to happen. Our politicians do not know how to limit spending. Everybody in this room limits spending in your household. You save, you sacrifice when you're sending a child to college or when you're uh, having a son or a daughter get married, or you want to take that dream family vacation. You've got to make certain that the bottom line balances. If not, the creditors are there. So the federal government has proven, in my opinion, that it can't control spending. And something has to happen. Because as you look at this, um, our national debt is $21.3 trillion. It's almost 106% of GDP. The highest it ever was, ladies and gentlemen, in the history of this country was just after World War II when we had huge debt because we were the arsenal of democracy and we did, along with our Canadian partners and some of our key European partners, we beat back tyranny, but it was a huge cost. And so we ran a lot of debt to finance World War II. Our national debt was 127% of GDP. But when Ronald Reagan took office, our national debt was only 35% of GDP. So maybe 35% was too low. Can't believe I'm saying that. But I think we can all agree that 106% is, is too high. And then if you think about how you're going to pay debt, the debt off, um, Right now, every man, woman, and child, Oliver, our, our two-year-old grandson, he owes uh, 68, almost $69,000. Everybody in this country, all 330 plus million people, if you were to pay the debt off, you gotta assign it. We're almost, we're closing in on 70,000 apiece. Or per taxpayer, if you look at it, it's almost $200,000 per taxpayer. And, you think about the fact that taxpayers are uh, you know, more logical people that are going to pay for the, the economy. And so when you, you look at the state of the US economy and the state of the Michigan economy, tax and regulatory reform, both at the state of Michigan level and under President Trump, I believe, are key to the economic growth that, that we've been experiencing. Uh, the job market is good, but as I noted in the slides, it's slowing a little bit. Corporate profits are strong, but they're, they're weakening a little bit. If you look at pension and 401ks, this is what's always amazing to me when um, uh, some of the um, politicians attack corporations or they attack profits. What most people don't understand is that the vast majority of corporate profits are not held by Sam Walton and his family or Bill Gates and his family. The vast majority of that wealth is held by pension funds, by the Northwood University pension fund, by your individual company pension funds, by your 401ks. And so the vast majority of people that benefit from healthy corporations and high profits and a stock market of over 27,000 on the Dow Jones are the pension funds and the millions and millions of average Americans just trying to make the world a better place and have a better life for themselves and their, their families. So 401k pensions are strong because of, of the stock market and God bless it and let's hope it continues. Wage growth under President uh, Trump has been very strong. It's been strong in the state of Michigan. R&D growth has been one of the cornerstones of this expansion. Although the last couple of months, uh, uh, investment in R&D and in, in inventories has uh, uh, declined a little bit. The major problem, the thing that keeps me up at night in an economic sense, Kent, is the, the fact that our national debt is, 
is as high as it is. And the thing that you need to remember is we finance our national debt at an average interest rate of about 2%. So what I worry most about is if we return to a strong, robust economy with a $20 trillion plus national debt, what happens if the interest rate goes to 3% or to 4%? All of a sudden, government needs to come up with hundreds of billions of dollars just to finance the, uh, the national debt, which is the second largest item in the federal budget. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn it over to the star of the show, my dear friend and former student, <laughs> Jonathan Williams. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Nash, and I bring you greetings from the land of make-believe, Washington, D.C., where I am based. As uh, the great President Ronald Reagan would say, Washington is an island surrounded by reality. And so when I have a chance to get off of the island and back into reality, especially when that reality is as beautiful as it is here at Bay Harbor, I jump at the chance. And uh, being a free market guy in Washington is not all that easy, as you can imagine. And taking the Northwood idea to Washington is not all that easy. There's a lot of big government folks out there that don't like what we talk about here, and they want to enhance spending, they want to enhance debt, and there's just people that are going to double down on that, and we're going to see it continually as we get closer to silly season when it comes to the campaign season. And happy to answer questions because I think it's, you know, everyone always say, well, you know, how do you make it in Washington? Uh, it was attributed at least to President Harry Truman that said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog, because uh, it's a pretty lonely place. And luckily for me, I have a dog, I have a beautiful wife, and I have a beautiful 10-month-old at home. So I have three friends, at least. And by the way, I, let, I met Mr. Coons last night, so we have a fourth friend in Washington, at least. Uh, and so today, I want to talk a little bit about what we do at ALEC. And uh, every day, I have the privilege of really, when I've left Northwood, graduated in 2005, it's almost like I never left because I get to live the Northwood idea every single day working for free market policy across the 50 states. And it's an incredible pleasure to, you know, watch what's happening in Washington and trying to keep an eye on all the bad ideas there, but actually go into these 50 laboratories of democracy that Justice Brandeis talked about, which are the state capitals, the state lawmakers, that we have these abilities to now actually see competition, see free market competition work every single day. And taking the principles that I learned here at Northwood from people like Dr. Nash and Dr. Fry and Dr. Bennett and so many others here that are even in this room, um, it's just been an incredible pleasure. Uh, and that my organization has been around since 1973. And actually, we have a huge Michigan tie because at that time, there was a little known at the time freshman state lawmaker from mid-Michigan by the name of John Engler. And he was one of the founders of ALEC. He got together a group of other young state lawmakers, Tommy Thompson in Wisconsin, who became governor and secretary of uh, health and human services. Terry Branstad, the current uh, ambassador to China, was an ALEC founder, so we have a great presence of people that wanted to bring conservative free market ideas uh, to state government. And, you know, I think it's important to preface everything that I say today, and I agree 100% with everything Tim said, of course, uh, and uh, I never do disagree with Tim. That's kind of a rule of thumb. Uh, you know, everything I think it should be prefaced, though, that the ideas that we're going to talk about are fact-based, they're data-based. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, Libertarian, heck, Vegetarian, these ideas <laughs> all just matter based on the data. It's not even about left versus right. As Reagan would say, it's about up versus down. And we're going to talk about what's working and what's not working across states. And of course, we'll have a little fun along the way. Uh, I was told when I was at Northwood that accounting is fun, and I still have the t-shirt, Professor Bennett. <laughs> I'm here to tell you a new one, that tax policy is fun, and economic policy is fun, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And in honor of Professor Bennett, we will have a pop quiz at the end of today's <laughs> presentation. So be ready and be taking good notes, and we're going to move kind of quickly so we can get to as many of your questions as we can today. Um, so 
a couple of the things that I wanted to talk about is, A, just reiterate a little bit of what Dr. Nash said about federal tax reform. This is a picture, as you can tell, not President Trump, not President Obama, not President Bush or Clinton or Bush. This was President Ronald Reagan. That was the last time we had federal tax reform, and it was 31 long years ago. In fact, to tell you how long ago, 31 years, just to remind everybody how far uh, it, it took and how long it, it took to get to federal tax reform is, uh, this is where we were in 1986. Top Gun was number one at the box office in 1986. Uh, we, of course, had that type of technology. And one of my personal favorites, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, with the cameo of the Laffer Curve, if you look closely on the chalkboard, that was, of course, what was happening in 1986. Now, what happened in terms of policy? The United States fell behind in tax policy by standing still. We, at in the 1980s, before, right around the time of this 1986 Tax Reform Act, the United States corporate tax was 30 5%. And we were about the United we were about the OECD average of world economies at that point. Now, fast forward to where we were pre uh, Trump tax reform, and while the United States had stayed at 35%, the rest of the world left us behind because the OECD average was then at the point of about 22 or 23% average corporate income tax rate. And so we are seeing these horrible stories about inversions of US companies becoming foreign companies for no other good reason but to take advantage of better tax policy overseas. And so I think, you know, we had the estimate, my co-author Art Laffer of uh, my book, Rich States, Poor States, just had a piece in Fox News this week talking about we, there was an estimate of two to three trillion dollars of United States corporate profits of U.S. companies that were sitting overseas because of tax reasons. And in the early months now, after federal tax reform, bringing 35 down to 21 on the C-Corp, reducing on small business as well, we've seen about eight to nine hundred billion dollars of those profits repatriated back to work for the United States economy. That is early results that's very proud to see, I think, and we can all be very proud to see, because the federal tax reform got misinterpreted a lot in the media. Imagine that, right? That they would get things wrong when it comes to economics and policy, but that's a little known fact that is not being talked about, uh, that the 90% you know, of Americans saw tax cuts on average, uh, that the vast majority of those people saw large tax cuts, and they were actually this is one I'd be curious if anybody here knows. Does anybody here know that the Trump tax reform actually made the tax code more progressive? It did because of the child care tax credit being doubled from 1,000 to 2,000 per child because of the standard deduction being doubled, it actually made the code more progressive. So it's not something you're gonna see on MSNBC or read in the New York Times, but those are the facts of federal tax reform. And I think it's gonna be very good for US competitiveness where at least now the men and women, the American workers are back on an equal playing field with the rest of the world. And I think that was one of the big things uh, that we can all be proud of when it comes to federal tax reform. Now, when it comes to uh, what's going going on uh, a couple of different things at the state level. And Dr. Nash actually mentioned something that was very important. I was just on Stuart Varney on Fox recently talking about the $22 trillion national debt. We saw the new uh, $1 trillion annual deficit number that just got reported by the President's uh, Office of Management and Budget. So we're talking about some big, scary numbers here. But as Dr. Nash pointed out, 49 out of the 50 states have balanced budget requirements, some better than others. California has a balanced budget amendment. It means nothing. Uh, but others do. Indiana actually has a very good balanced budget. They just put in their state constitution. Uh, uh, Illinois, their balanced budget doesn't mean a whole lot. But there are some things that really do matter at the state level. And, and we were actually very proud to work with Senate Budget Committee recently where they had a hearing of what the federal government can learn from state best practices when it comes to budgets. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something I think we are sorely lacking in Washington, is people in Washington looking into these 50 laboratories of democracy to get answers. Because I'll tell you what, we have a lot of problems in this country, but the answers will not come from Washington, D.C. They're going to come from the states and the people of the states. And that was the whole idea behind the Tenth Amendment to this Constitution, is we didn't want central planners in some far off big city, Washington, D.C., making these kind of decisions. We wanted state policymakers, local policymakers, and at the end of the day, empowering people, individuals themselves to make these kinds of decisions. Uh, and so that's just a little bit on the federalism side. One of the things, though, that often uh, the media often ignores as well when it comes to tax reform is this. 
is that we're seeing a trend at the state level, just like we saw post-1986 when Ronald Reagan cut taxes dramatically. And that is states are using the, the hot economy, the strong revenue, but also, and I'm going to get into the weeds. I'm a tax economist in, by trade here, so I'm going to warn you just in advance. We're going to get into the weeds really briefly, and then I'll bring us back out. But here's the weed, is when it comes to tax codes, Every state that has an income tax generally starts with federal adjusted gross income or federal uh, taxable income as their starting point. So what happened at the federal level with federal tax reform is we broadened the tax base, made more things taxable, lowered the rates so the vast majority of people saw reductions. But by the f federal base being that much broader, the states started out with a whole lot of new revenue by doing nothing. And that was the, really the whole battle across the states. Luckily, Michigan lawmakers got together in 2018 and gave it back to Michigan taxpayers through an enhanced standard deduction and personal exemption here in Michigan. But there, the battle is playing out across the states, and some states want to just hoard the revenue and spend it and hope that taxpayers don't know the difference. And that was the case in predictable states like New York and California and Illinois and New Jersey. Uh, but you had many states, like those states up on the slide right here, like Iowa and Missouri in the Midwest actually had the largest tax reforms in state history this last year because of the Trump tax reform effect in this whole linkage of their state tax code to the federal tax code. And one that uh, it doesn't get any play, but it really should because it's just too good, is that even Bernie Sanders' Vermont cut income taxes this year because of the federal tax reform effect on Vermont. So Mr. Sanders, millionaires and billionaires, uh, has taken advantage of what happened when it comes to federal tax reform. So that's, it's kind of fun to see what has happened across the states. Um, let me skip through a couple of these and just say this. One of my favorite economists, Thomas Sowell, uh, anybody here a fan of Thomas Sowell? And When We Are Free, great uh, editions of the, of the book that Sowell wrote. I think he hits the nail on the head of what our problem is. As Dr. Nass said, it's not a revenue problem. We're hitting record revenue receipts at the federal and state level. It's a spending problem. And Sowell sums it up as this. I couldn't do any better myself. And that is, the first law of economics is what? Scarcity of resources. We don't have everything that we want. However, the first law of politics is to ignore the first law of economics. <laughs> and there we have our problem, right? And that is really what we need to um, overcome. And at the federal level, it's very difficult to overcome that dynamic, but it's easier at the state level. And our hope as organization of state lawmakers, 2,000 across the United States, Republicans and Democrats alike, that we can take the best practices and case studies and take them to Washington to make a difference. So when it comes to tax policy, um, I get very excited. As I mentioned, tax policy is fun, and it should be fun. Uh, you know, the uh, you know, good tax policy, one of my favorite tax policy jokes, I'll tell you this briefly, which is, you all know the difference between an introverted tax economist and an extroverted tax economist, right? So the introverted tax economist looks at his shoes when he talks to you. On the other hand, the extroverted tax economist looks at your shoes when he talks to you. So <laughs> that's the world that I come from. And I was always taught by Professor Luzar at Northwood that if you set expectations really low in public speaking, you'll do pretty well in life. So that's, uh, I, I guess I do. Uh, when it comes to uh, what's happening, though, at tax policy in the states, uh, one of the things, of course, and it's a little hard to see on the slide. I apologize for the coloring there. My co-author, Art Laffer, of course, came up with the concept that we're seeing play out every single year, and that is taxes are a disincentive to do something. When you tax something, you get less of it. When you tax something less, you get more of it. And what it, Laffer Curve always showed was that people change their behavior based on incentives, and taxes are a clear incentive, in this case, a disincentive. So at a 0% tax rate, you raise zero revenue, right? It's pretty straightforward. But at a 100% tax rate, how much revenue do you raise? And this is what gets the mainstream media and a lot of big spending politicians in trouble, is they actually think that when you raise revenue, you're going to see a linear relationship with the increase of the tax rate and the revenue. And it doesn't work that way because people decide to take more time on their boats and, and less time building businesses if the rates get too high. Reagan would always tell the story that when he hit the 90 percent marginal tax rate when he was an actor, he would stop making movies. And of course, that would, that's what it was coming out of World War II before Democrat President JFK cut tax rates and of course before Ronald Reagan cut tax rates and so this gets misconstrued a bit and it gets made fun of in, in the media and by some big taxing and spending interests out there but at the end of the day it's very difficult if not impossible to disprove the theory of competitiveness of really why competitiveness matters 
And one of the uh, ways that we measure this every year in rich states, poor states, is just talking about how much Americans, as we say, vote with their feet from one state to another. And we have this idea of Americans doing sorting based on economic opportunities. And since we do have the freedom of mobility, I think it's pretty clear that there's a difference of governing philosophies between the states that have seen a huge in-migration of Americans and the states that have suffered a huge out-migration of Americans. And this is not one year, this is a whole decade's worth of data that we have. And by the way, I should caveat this to say, this is not birth rates and death rates. This is not international immigration. This is just net domestic migration of Americans while they're in the United States, where they're deciding to go. And you can see the results are pretty clear for themselves. So the states that are valuing the Northwood idea of free markets and individual liberty and lower taxes and lower business costs are winning. There's no doubt about it. You look at the case study of Texas. I mean, a, a really a state that kept the United States economy afloat during the Great Recession of the last decade because of exploration and oil and gas and just overall free market policies. They're the big winners, gaining about 1.3 million new Americans on net over the last 10 years. Florida is about a million new Americans on net. Now, I know we have a lot of people here that are very intelligent and follow the news and tax policy. What do those two states have in common when it comes to the makeup of their tax policy? Zero personal income tax, right? That is actually one of the most important factors as we measure the competitiveness of states is what is the price of work that you place on earning profits, on living and working and investing in your state? Since people are mobile, you can change your tax domicile very easily. A lot of New Yorkers are, a lot of folks are in the, in the right side of this column. And uh, this is something, like I said, this is not a Republican versus Democrat issue. This is pure data, Americans voting with their feet. And North Carolina, a state that's done tremendous tax reform in recent years. Anybody want to know, Michigan's tax system is phenomenal now relative to what it used to be. But do you know what the corporate tax rate in North Carolina is today? 2.5%. And they started at something like three times that amount as part of tax reform. So they become very competitive recently, Colorado and Arizona. Now, of course, I think, you know, the uh, Reagan would always say the line about the, the left wing view of the economy can be summed up as this. And this summarizes these states very well. If it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. And if it stops moving, subsidize it. And that's the philosophy of the states, really, that have been suffering the out-migration over the last uh, 10 years. New York down 1.3 million. Unfortunately, Illinois down almost 800,000, uh, with a lot of bad policies either being enacted this year or coming in the future. I, I'm, quite, um, I'm quite bearish on Illinois' future when it comes. They just passed a $15 an hour minimum wage law statewide with no exemptions for small business to speak of and no uh, exemptions for cost of living in downstate. They're going to be looking at a progressive millionaire's tax on the ballot in 2020. Uh, so lots of, of troubling things happening in some of these states. Now, I apologize to any Sparties here, but uh, as a U of M fan and growing up there, we just talked about a lot of big numbers. And it's easy to glaze over 100,000 here, 100,000 there, million here. But who's here sat in the big house, right? A lot of you. How does it feel when you sit there? You feel pretty small when you're looking around 113,000 or so fellow football fans. And think about this for a second. Some of these states that we just talked about, like New York and California, they've lost 10, 12, 13 of these stadiums on net of their taxpayers that are going to other states because they can't get it right when it comes to their mix of competitiveness back home. It just tells you a bit about the magnitude, I think, when you think about it that way. Um, and when you look at um, some of the, we can get to the next slide here, some of the political ramifications as well is obviously when people leave a state, that means political decisions get made differently because every 10 years we measure the state population and we draw congressional lines based on those uh, population changes. And here are the predictions so far for 2020 when it comes to congressional districts and changes that we're seeing. You can see uh, Texas is the big winner, gaining three new U.S. House districts in 2020, likely, because of that massive in-migration. Florida being another big winner at uh, two congressional districts gained. And then many of the other states that were in that uh, list earlier also gaining congressional districts. Uh, on the other side, you know, Michigan is still recovering from uh, lots of legacy problems during the last decade. Uh, lots of bad ideas that were certainly enacted here in previous years and we're digging our way out of it. There's still a little bit of pain there and we're gonna lose another seat it looks like when it comes to the 2020 round of redistricting in Michigan. But the big one is New York gonna lose another two. And then by the way, California is an interesting historical case study in that 
that California became a state roughly in 1850. In every single decade from 1850 to 2010, California gained new congressional representation, sometimes three or four or five new U.S. House seats every single decade because of the vast in-migration, the opportunities that California presented. 2010 was the first time in state history that California did not gain a new congressional district because of this massive out-migration effect. And fast forward to 2020, there's a very real possibility that California will lose its first congressional district in history because of the out-migration effect. Um, so it does have real political consequences uh, to go with the economic consequences that we've talked about today. Oops, it looks, there we go. And this is just a little bit more of a look back. This goes to 1960 to give you a historic look at this. And it's a little hard to read, but New York is down 14 members of the U.S. House and their delegation since 1960 because of the vast out-migration, the high taxes, loss of economic opportunity. Now, for many in this room, uh, you're probably very happy that there's not going to be another AOC roaming the halls of Congress coming from New York, right? But there is a real political uh, price to pay uh, when it comes to these states and out-migration. like we might. There we go. And here's one of the very interesting takeaways, as I alluded to it earlier from our research in rich states, poor states, is that we know all taxes matter for economic growth. Some just matter more than others. And so what we do here is we isolate, there are nine states of these 50 laboratories of democracy that do not tax personal income. We talked about the big ones earlier. That was Texas and Florida. Um, but here are the others. There's states like Tennessee who's booming. There was a great Wall Street Journal article recently highlighting Nashville's success and attracting international investment and just the population boom uh, in Nashville recently. And then there's states, small states like New Hampshire. There's small states like South Dakota, uh, Wyoming, Alaska. And then even Washington State, which maybe has gone a little bit left when it comes to many policies, but has retained their no income tax status. And in fact, an interesting political story there was Bill Gates Sr. actually funded a ballot initiative years ago to try to create an income tax. One of these kind of patriotic millionaires saying that we need to raise taxes. Well, billionaires. of course, he was, yeah, billionaires, that's right. Uh, and of course, he's always welcome to cut a check to the government to, uh, if, if there's any kind of guilt that he has in not paying enough taxes. But he decided to try to foist it on the entire state. Well, guess what? Even blue Washington state rejected by a large margin the income tax because they know what it's done for their economic outlook. In fact, some of these states even advertise on their development of uh, economic development websites is come on in, do business in our state, and you don't have a state income tax. So what we do here is we isolate those nine states versus the nine states in America that have the highest income taxes on individual income. And one thing that often gets overlooked by kind of the rhetoric out there of the Bernie Sanders type is that small businesses, the vast majority of them who are creating the vast majority of new jobs in this country as entrepreneurs, are paying on the individual side of the income tax. And so when you eliminate or reduce individual income tax rates, you're actually incentivizing entrepreneurship and job creation and new startups. And so that's been one of the understated effects. But you look at the results here, and whether it's gross state product growth over a decade, whether it's population growth, whether it's job growth, or by the way, whether it's revenue growth, this gets back to the Laffer Curve discussion, is when you have a competitive state economy, you keep costs down, you actually have seen very robust revenue growth in states without an income tax. And so we're working with state lawmakers all across the country to try to get income tax rates down on businesses and individuals. And there may actually be an opportunity coming up in the next year or so for North Dakota to be the 10th no income tax state. Uh, only one state in the history of our nation has eliminated their income tax, and that was Alaska. And of course, they had some resources to help them out coming out of the ground uh, to get that done. And so it'd be very monumental, I think, if we were able to get North Dakota to become the 10th no income tax state in the next year. So stay tuned when it comes to uh, that debate going forward. And let me uh, get it to our rankings here. Here is our 2019 rich states, poor states rankings and economic outlook, as Dr. Nash alluded to, and a very similar rank Michigan to the Northwood ranking and some of the other rankings that you see out there. But here's the 50 state map. And Michigan comes in number 12 now when it comes to economic outlook. And I will say, traveling out now across the 50 states and working with all of our members, if I go to a state, uh, I'm not gonna pick any right now, Illinois or California, 
Uh, but if I go to a state and they feel kind of down and out and hopeless at the moment, I think one of the best stories in our recent memory, and may, perhaps in any of our lifetime, is the Michigan comeback story. You know, to think that Michigan would go from single state recession, 10 years of double digit unemployment, we know all the bad statistics because you lived them all here. To, for Michigan to be able to cut taxes, to become a right to work state, is just remarkable. And I think it provides real hope when it comes to states across the country that are struggling to get out from under uh, bad economic conditions. And so I think it's been so important to see that momentum continue uh, here in Michigan. So it wasn't just a blip on the radar. Now, you'll see a few of the, the states that do especially well. Utah is actually ranked number one all 12 years of the Rich States, Poor States book that we've put together. Now, uh, you may be wondering why that's the case. So there's a lot of interesting reasons to talk through why Utah has been at number one, but they do things very innovatively, I think, overall in Utah. They've kept a very prudent approach to budgeting. They don't uh, get out uh, from under uh, the, the deficit situation and debt situation like many states. But let, let me point out a couple that I think Michigan and other states could learn some lessons from. Michigan's actually done some of this as well. One is, I think one of the greatest risks to future economic outlook in the states is boiling under the surface right now. Accountants know about this, economists know about this, but it's the unfunded pension obligations that states have made promises to public employees in these defined benefit plans that are remaining. Uh, and they've made these promises without putting the money aside to actually pay for them when the bills come due in many cases. And they use bad accounting assumptions. We're, we're gonna have to talk about this. The Government Accounting Standards Board is what state and local governments use, which does not use generally accepted accounting principles like you would see in the FASB standards. So it allows governments to play all kinds of games when it comes to their pension systems. They assume 8 or 9 percent rate of return on their assets for the next 30 years, where the remaining, the remaining defined benefit plans in the private sector follow ERISA laws. There's no such protection in the, the government plans, and ERISA laws allows uh, assumptions of something like 4.5 percent on rates of return. Uh, and so the, this is a huge problem that's building. Utah and Michigan and some others have taken the lead and said, let's transition at least new hires into defined contribution plans that are doing so well because of the stock market boom right now. But by the way, it gives young workers portability, and it's a great thing because if you've hired a millennial for any of your businesses, I've hired a few, you know that they're not going to probably stay and work for you for 30 or 40 years like their parents or their grandparents' generation would. They're going to probably have five times uh, jobs by the time they're 10 years into their career, I would guess, in many cases, because they like to jump and see what works for them. And so state pension plans are a relic of, of a past generation, and what we need is more flexibility, and by the way, then it protects taxpayers. Because if we don't get to the bottom of this, I think the Illinois scenario is really uh, Connecticut and states like that are telling us if states push the envelope here and don't address the issue. Uh, let me tell you one story of Illinois, which I found shocking, for, even for somebody who follows this every day, and that is, oh, if you go back five years now in Illinois, 90% of all new education dollars for the state of Illinois have gone to pension costs and not to teacher salaries, not to the classroom, not to textbooks, not to all the other things. Teachers and classrooms and kids are being robbed because of promises that were made to past generations that were not funded well. So uh, this is a huge issue, both for Republicans and Democrats alike, to come together and solve. And if we don't solve it, there's going to be a whole lot more states raising taxes over the coming years. So I think that is one of the big threats out there. So Utah transitioned to defined contribution, like Michigan and some other states. But one other thing they've done in Utah, which I think is phenomenal, given the fact we just talked about $22 trillion in national debt, and that is, they have gotten to an understanding that the federal gravy train is going to come to an end at some point. In this world of $22 trillion, there's no way the federal government keeps sending money out to the states like it has been. Uh, and that might be a good thing for federalism, because with federal dollars come federal strings and requirements and all kinds of things that gives states less autonomy. But when it comes to Utah, what they've done is they created a plan to say, if and when federal government support goes down, whether it's education, health and human services, what other area, we will have a plan to pick up the priority projects at the state level. They, they, it's an amazing way to kind of have a contingency plan to say, when the federal government cuts back, what will we do as a state to make sure that essential government services are not interrupted? And by the way, the bond rating agencies have said that's one of the reasons they've kept a AAA bond rating in Utah, because they have planned for the inevitable when the federal government does uh, run out of the quote unquote free federal money that we've seen debated so many times in the state capitals. 
And so um, I think, um, you know, we've got, in the effort of getting to some questions, I want to skip a few other uh, slides and just end with a couple of things here. And that is, we have, I think, an incredible opportunity because of the way that our founders set up our republic. And that is, we have 50 case studies to look at every single year. And the good news here, is, I'm happy to report, is that freedom is winning across the 50 states. The Northwood idea is winning across the 50 states because there's such a thing as competition between states. States can't get away with things or they lose their residents, they lose their businesses like we talked about, the hemorrhaging of jobs and individuals away from high tax states and big government states like New York and California, Illinois, is, is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many more interesting stories to cover, but as long as we give states that autonomy and we allow federalism to work, that not everything is going to be centralized in a far-off government authority in Washington, D.C., I am very confident that we may have some tough times ahead at the federal level. We are going to continue to see free markets and the Northwood idea succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back in Michigan. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Jonathan and Tim. Look, good news is we have about 25 minutes to entertain any questions that you might have for uh, these uh, two remarkable individuals. Uh, we do have a couple of microphones, I uh, understand, one and two, that they'll be uh, brought to you. Is anyone? We're going to start with my colleague, Kristen. Thanks. Thanks for an inspiring talk from both of you. Question, Tim Nash, on the drivers for the increases in Michigan's ranking over the years. And as you look at, you tantalized us with an, an additional improvement, are the drivers the same or are they changing over time? Well, that, that's a great question, Christian. And, and when you think about it, Kristen, I think the key is for the state of Michigan, it's been regulatory reform, and it's been tax reform have been the, the key drivers. And I think that, um, you know, the hope is that they'll continue. Certainly you have a, a new governor who, who is, is a, a very bright person, who is a very uh, knowledgeable person. And, and hopefully the key is that, uh, that Governor Whitmer will, will continue to keep the regulatory reform movement going, to keep taxes at least at the income level, at the corporate level, personal level, at a reasonable rate. And then simultaneously, uh, you know, she's right, we need to fix the roads, but I, I think there are some more market solutions uh, that, that we, we can put in place. So I, I'm guardedly optimistic that uh, Governor Whitmer will, there will be a good check and balance between the House and Senate and the governor so that we can continue these reforms. You know, it, you know Jonathan mentioned that Michigan is the, uh, uh, became the 25th right to work state. Now, who would have thought, you know, those of us that grew up in Michigan, that Michigan would ever become a right to work state? And, uh, the, you know, we were very honored that the governor uh, told uh, uh, Keith Pretty and myself that our study, the data, it's, you know, it's 200 pages uh, when our study comes out, so it'll be good uh, reading material to put you to sleep when it comes out uh, in, in about a month and a half. But uh, you know, the, there was a tremendous amount of data because we compared the right to work states' performance with the non right to work states, and, and Michigan um, you know, literally uh, surprised everybody when we became the 25th right to work state. And, and just a, a quick side note, but uh, for some of, uh, some of my uh, uh, fellow alums in the room, Bill Cole is a name that rings a bell for, for a lot of people. And Bill uh, uh, is a Northwood grad, an automobile dealer, a truck dealer, and uh, Eastern Tennessee, uh, West Virginia, et cetera. Bill was the Lieutenant Governor and President of the State Senate of West Virginia, a Northwood alum. And uh, I worked with Bill quite a bit and he used our study from a couple of years ago and the data to make West Virginia the 26th right toward state. So when you think about this great university, you know, who'd have thunk that a car dealer would become the Lieutenant Governor of West Virginia and dramatically change. And West Virginia has been another state mm -hmm. That's been on the rise, and so the, you know, the the, the Northwood idea is, is quite interesting. And one of the points that Kent made uh, the other day is that you know we're not just a business institution, but but who would have thought that, um, you know, I mean, I'm thinking of people in the classroom when my better half and I studied at Northwood, and that somebody was going to become the lieutenant governor and the president of the Senate of West Virginia, and and then dramatically change the economy. It's uh, 
it's a special place that uh, that we're all part of. And one thing, uh, to just to add to that, is I would agree with what Tim said, is, is per usual, but uh, when it comes to right to work, I think it just underscores the importance of tax competition and, and policy competition between the states. Because I think it's safe to say, having talked to a lot of the Michigan lawmakers, is it relies so much on the good data that Northwood and others had put out as part of that debate. I think it's safe to say, though, that if Indiana had not become a right to work state in the year or two before Michigan, it's very unlikely that Michigan would have accomplished it in Wisconsin and West Virginia and Kentucky and kind of this whole trend towards right to work in the Midwest. And I will say it's not the, for the faint of heart. I remember getting a text from Eric Nesbitt, now the Senate president here in Michigan, back when he was in the House the day before they went live. And they were expecting massive protests in Lansing. You probably remember seeing it in the news. The, hot, the poor hot dog cart guy got his vendor thing uh, turned over in Lansing. So there's a reason why people try to stop it, is they try to instill fear to in, in engage in these big reforms. But it takes leadership. It takes perseverance to do what we know is right. And by the way, you know, this the idea that right to work is bad for unions for some reason, it's absolutely not because what unions need is economic growth too. They need more jobs coming back to the United States. And so there was a study done post right to work in Indiana to compare union job growth in Indiana versus Illinois, a non right to work state. And Indiana's union job growth has been eight to times, eight to nine times larger than union job growth in Illinois after right to work in Indiana. So there you have it. And I just want to go on record as saying when the data came out and then the right to work debate started in Lansing, I took my bride on vacation for that week. And um, it was a good thing because it was a, it was a very interesting debate in Lansing. But um, when you look at where we are today, Jonathan's absolutely right that um, uh, Indiana was the key. I, I don't think our study would have ever uh, uh, been asked to be produced if it hadn't been for the fact that um, Indiana became a right to work state. And so that competition, the fact that um, there were a lot of businesses leaving Michigan and going to Indiana, just crossing the border, you know, Indiana is now considered to be the home of the mobile home industry. You go back 40 years ago, Michigan was the home of the mobile, the, not just the motor, but the mobile home industry. And that production, because of tax cuts in Indiana, went 10, 15 miles across the border. Millions and millions of, of dollars of business, thousands of jobs literally crossed the state into, Indi into Indiana. And so we, we forget that, um, you know, as uh, the great British economist and historian T.S. Ashton noted, people vote with their feet. And, uh, you know, the, the British Industrial Revolution took place because people left the farms under feudalism and voluntarily went to work in the factories because as bad as the factory conditions were compared to today, those factory conditions in England were phenomenal versus working 20 hours out of 30 or 20 hours out of 24 hours a day on a farm. It was very arduous. It was, it was, they were terrible conditions. And so the economic incentives are key and uh, the fact that businesses are so mobile, it makes a huge difference. And so the, that competition in the Midwest is, has been wonderful, and, and if Illinois ever catches on, it'll be wonderful for the whole community. It'll be more competition, right. but we might end up being Germany in a couple of years, the Great Lakes states, rather than France. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Tim, a question down front. Yes, what effect do you think if somehow we don't end up making a deal with China on some of these trade policies in Japan? How much effect do you think that'll have with the economy in the future, and also, do you agree with the, the approach that Trump is uh, trying to, to achieve these things whose tariffs. What's your feelings on those? Well, you have a golf game at 1.30, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so having said that, uh, Dr. Coons, here, here's my answer. Um, I am, without a doubt, an unabashed free trader. And so uh, a big part of me says, let's stop this silliness and let's look internally at what we need to do better to compete. There is not a country that can compete with the American competitive free enterprise system. But we have to look at our tax environment. We've got to look at our regulatory climate, K through 12 education. We have seen the enemy and the enemy is us. There's no one that can compete for the higher order jobs in the United States. So it's not China's fault that we're where we are in general or Mexico's fault. If we're not competing as well, then, it, then we need to do better. Simultaneously, 
you know, 100 years ago, we were the, the, the country that uh, was in, inheriting the jobs and doing well. So uh, in general, the quick answer is I'm a free trader and I don't like a lot of the president's trade policies. However, when it comes to intellectual capital and intellectual property theft, uh, I, I think the president's right. And that's where it's a, it's a difficult balancing act because it's not as simple as free trade versus fair trade. Uh, th this whole issue of the theft of intellectual property, uh, I just wish my, my mentor and dear friend Milton Friedman were still alive because um, you know, it'd be interesting to see what he would think in this unique situation where the theft of intellectual property is costing American businesses untold dollars. Uh, just recently, uh, 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 Steve Ballmer, the uh, uh, recently retired CEO of uh, Microsoft, who uh, owns the Los Angeles Clippers uh, basketball team, he was interviewed and he said that if you look at uh, the following data in China, just as an example, 95% of all of the computers operating systems for personal computers are powered by Microsoft uh, operating systems. So they have PowerPoint, Excel, Word, right? And he said, if you look at the proper revenue that Microsoft should be getting, instead of making a profit of less than a half billion on the Chinese economy with 95% of the software being Microsoft, instead of making the half billion they're making today, they should be making at least $10 billion. But the fact of the matter is, you know, it's the old, I remember this, this Wall Street Journal uh, uh, um, uh, cartoon one time, you know, the cartoons of the Wall Street Journal. And I, and I was thinking about the fact that, you know, somebody, the old commercial or the old cartoon where somebody would say, you wanna buy a watch? You know, you'd open up and you have all the watches. Well, there's this one computer, car, this cartoon recently Want to buy some software? <laughs> and, and that's the problem. They illegally sell Microsoft software. Uh, but you name any great American software company, and it is being taken advantage of left and right. And that doesn't even include some of the high-tech theft you know, for companies like Dow Chemical or DuPont or, or uh, uh, other um, companies in, the, in the, um, say, the genetic engineering space. So I do think it's time we, we put our feet down and say, listen, we're not going to settle for crumbs. And, Intellectual property rights are important and they should be enforced in the world economy the way they are in the United States. Because if not, our, our great advantage goes away. Uh, you know, our, we're the, we're the uh, arsenal of intellect, uh, we're, we're the cornerstone, the laboratory of intellectual growth. Jonathan, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, and that's, that's such an important question because I haven't seen it quantified, but there's no doubt that there is a dampening effect right now on the market and uh, overall economy because of this uncertainty. Uh, and uh, I think at the end of the day, the, a huge victory and an unlocking effect would be to come up with some sort of a, a real deal, and hopefully that sooner rather than later. Because, I mean, this bull market is old, and uh, we're stretching the limits. And I think, quite honestly, we'd probably be in a downturn if it wasn't for the competitiveness enhancing regulatory and tax relief that we've seen recently in Washington. But I think that would be the thing that could give this uh, some additional money months and years, certainly. Uh, you know, we saw, you know, this is, this is an interesting political question, certainly. When it comes internally, there are lots of different voices that the president is hearing. You know, some are ardent free traders, like the two of us up here, like my friend Larry Kudlow and Art Laffer and Steve Moore. And then you have others that maybe are less so. Uh, but I think what uh, you have to read President Trump in the way that you would read uh, his book, The Art of the Deal. I think a lot of this is posturing and maneuvering. And unfortunately, the, the rhetoric sometimes does affect the market in wild ways when you see some sort of announcement or a tweet uh, come out from the White House. But when you look at, with, even with the renegotiation of NAFTA, uh, with um, the USMCA. Uh, the president uh, stuck with it, and we're going to get, so hopefully, we're going to get some sort of a, a good deal for the United States. Um, I think, you know, I'd, I'd love to get Kent's thoughts on this, but I mean, I think when I was up, I just gave a talk in Ottawa uh, this, uh, this spring, and many of the conservative members of parliament thought that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau got very much outmaneuvered, and of course, uh, Canada kind of walked away, and Trump said, we're going to go forward and do things with Mexico directly, and you guys can do your own thing, and then they came back to the table and got probably much 
much worse deal than Canada would have gotten otherwise. And uh, I think a lot of this is negotiation. Now, what I'd like to see is for him, the president, to really double down on his free market, free trade uh, position by saying, let's go to our friends in England. And right now they're being threatened by the EU with potential exit from the common market and, and uh, penalties from leaving uh, because of Brexit. Let's have some overtures there to have a bilateral trade agreement with our friends in England, or even uh, as to double down with Korea and Japan and with so Southeast Asia because of our pull out of the TPP negotiations. I think that would have been very key from a geopolitical perspective. So there's lots of work to do ahead, but I really do think that if a deal with China were to come forward, that's going to give this market a huge boost. Thanks, Jonathan. We have a question down front from one of our young alum, class of 2016, 17. I'm going to ask, though, for the microphone, just so that we can pick it up on the uh, uh, recorded version. Yeah, I just got a question in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the tariffs and stuff. So, you know, when you look at manufacturing in the United States, do you really see, you know, with the tariffs with China and Japan, do you really see that kind of growth in manufacturing because of those tariffs or you know kind of what is your what is your take on that do you really see that growth with the you know the 301 and the 232 tariffs most of the data that i've seen uh, the tariffs are harming greatly agriculture and agriculture is one of the largest uh, drivers of the michigan economy and a number of state economies so it, it would have a very positive impact on agriculture. It would bring down the price of food. You're starting to see food inflation uh, going up at a higher pace than uh, regular, the normal inflation rate. Certainly in the automobile industry, there are a number of key component parts, both in the aftermarket and uh, for the new car uh, production that would come into play. And I have to tell you, if we do not do something, you're going to see some rather large increases, 7 8 percent, I, I predict, in the next six months for automobiles, only because component parts are going to have to go up. And, you know, one of the beauties of a free market is you, you uh, shift to a global economy. One of the negatives, once you're outside of the United States, uh, when you get into these types of debates, we, we didn't think of producing in China 30 years ago. And today we have a disproportionately high amount of our manufacturing for automobiles, you know, uh, the, the, the chemical industry, et cetera. We depend on a lot of those products for production in the United States coming in as, uh, you know, subparts or component parts to the U.S. economy. So uh, our good friends in Canada are big suppliers, our good friends in Mexico, but, uh, and, and, you know, we can reopen some U.S. plants, but how quickly can we gear up uh, to make up for the long-term loss if we continue this debate with China? The flip side of the equation is the Chinese economy is having difficulty. The Chinese are, are stating that their economy is growing at 6%. Uh, I don't believe it. I'd say their economy is growing at 1% or 2%. And so this is difficult for the Chinese economy. And if we had had more time, I would have put a slide up showing, if you go back 10 years ago, the Chinese economy grew at about 14%. So my belief is it was probably 11% then. Now they're saying it's 6%. It's probably... Uh, about one or two percent and so this is harming the Chinese economy and I just wish both political parties the Chinese party the American party would get in the sandbox and play a little bit better and uh, realize one of my early statements that we can bake a bigger pie China can win the US can win on a global economy and if we become closer and less adversarial it, it's better for everybody because the average Chinese family wakes up in the morning and wants the same thing that everybody in this, this room does when we wake up in the morning. We want a better life for ourselves, our family, our communities, and, and that can happen only in a free and competitive economy. Thanks. Jonathan, do you have anything? No. Plus one to that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, one more down front. Kevin? Can you just touch on the current interest rate environment? Uh, this week, the Fed cut interest rates again. Um, some would argue that we really don't need an interest rate cut, and that's just to propel the current growth uh, mode that we're in. And you know how that relates to the national <coughs> national debt and where you see interest rates going in the future. 
Well, <clears throat> I'm not a monetary economist, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn recently, so let me <laughs> let me take a stab at that. And that is, it worries me a little bit the the news that came out. I mean, I think that's not good to see that rate cut done right now. I think that would it have been stronger signs certainly for the economy that the underlying health is better if they would have waited until the third or fourth quarter of this year. We knew that there's going to be uh, a cut or two probably based on the singling uh, signaling from the Fed. Uh, it does worry me that it was this soon, um, and that may point to some things that they're seeing in the economy, and that would that would be the thing that worries me the most out of that announcement. But also, I mean. We're still at pretty low historic levels of interest rates now. And that the other thing that worries me a little bit is that if and when, well, certainly it's going to be when we get to some sort of a downturn. Let's hope it's not a sharp downturn like 2008. Let's hope it's a weaker downturn. But you need to have some slack left over on interest rates where you can actually help uh, in that kind of a scenario. And so if you've given away all your slack before things really do kick off on a downturn, that would worry me a little bit because then you end up in the situation uh, like Japan and some of the other countries that we've seen where there's no slack left and they've had real negative interest rates now for quite some time. And what that's done to their economy has been pretty tragic, I think. Tim, would you like to, you're good? Any other questions? Yes. Wow. Time. Just. Yes. Yeah, so John, I think you just repeat the question, so we'll pick it up on the. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. The, the question is on the penny plan uh, for ways to reduce government spending and debt, and uh, you know, started with Congressman Penny uh, back years ago from Minnesota, and is can still being talked about in Washington. Um, I think it's like many things that we need to consider. I think it, we need to be kind of all of the above approaches to all the best ideas to how do we get the spending problem in check in Washington and the debt problem, and so if that's the if that's the vehicle that helps us get the way there in terms of of spending reductions in debt. Uh, I'm all for listening to those ideas. I, I hope that they get more traction. Um, I think that overall, we've got to be a little bit uh, careful on, uh, you know, there'll be some that will say, well, we need a approach, a balanced approach to say we need tax increases with some sort of spending reduction. And that's always dangerous just because we've clawed our way back into a competitive position with the world economies now at the United States. I think it's awfully important we don't backtrack on that and signal higher taxes, and that could be the thing that could, you know, put us into some sort of economic uh, downturn as an announcement of higher taxes. So I think, for me at least, it's a clear driver that we don't have a revenue problem; we have a spending problem. And I think there's some interesting things to look at. One of my favorites is what Colorado does in their state constitution. It's called the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, and it's been in the state constitution 25 years. Started as a local initiative in Colorado Springs, and what they did was say government cannot grow faster than population and inflation growth as a proxy for how quickly the government should be growing relative to the size of the private economy. And it's kept Colorado out of a whole lot of debt and liabilities issues that they would be in otherwise. I think taking a model like that that focuses really on the spending side, the penny plan, or something like Colorado's model, uh, the Swiss debt break has been an innovative way that the Swiss uh, federal government has kept uh, debt in check. There's lots of things, and I'm of all the above. We just need everybody in this room and your friends and everyone around the country to be talking about this issue because actually I think if we're talking about the risks for the next downturn, it's not going to be banking and mortgage, it's not going to be tech boom and the bubble breaking, it's going to be this massive bubble of government debt and government overreach I think is going to be the thing that really is going to cause us hurt long term. So I'm going to stop the questions there just so that we uh, honor the time that we're together. But I'm going to ask uh, Tim if he could just take a minute to, to wrap things up, and then I'll put some closure on the, uh, the session. Thank you, Ken. Ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you for being here. There are a lot of other places you could be. I keep looking out uh, at that uh, beautiful Lake Michigan there and thinking <laughs> it. Uh, I need to wrap this up quickly to get outside. <laughs> But there, there are three things that I'd like to leave you with. Number one, um, this is all about the size and scope of government. We happen to live in, I believe, the greatest country in the history of the world. But there are a number of great countries like the United States, Canada, a number of the European countries, Chile and South America. These are countries that believe in what we call the Northwood idea, that freedom and free enterprise, that free people can and do accomplish great things. 
And if you think about it, in this country, government consumed 3% of GDP at the local and state level, in eight, local, state, and federal level in 1800. In 1900, government consumed 7.8% of GDP at the local, state, and federal level. Five of that 7.8%, or two-thirds of it, a little more than two-thirds, was consumed by the state and the local government. So we truly were, to Jonathan's point, a federalist society. The, the, the founding fathers, the Constitution, was designed to make most decisions at the local and state level. Today, government consumes about 37% of GDP and over 25% of that 37%, or more than two-thirds, is controlled at the federal level. I'd leave you with the following. Number one, the, close, the, the further your tax dollars travel, the less effective they are because we don't know what's happening. To me, we need to take a long, hard look at the fact that maybe 8% was too low in 1900. Maybe. But we can all agree that 37% today is too high. Point one. Point two, when you give a dollar to your local church, when you give a dollar to the United Way, somewhere between 90 and 100 cents of that dollar gets to the poverty program that your church or the United Way is seeking to solve, the problem they're seeking to deal with. You give a dollar to the government to fight poverty, and you're lucky if 25 cents on the dollar gets to the poor person. There are a lot of things government doesn't do well, and therefore, the fact of the matter is 75% administrative cost for a lot of government programs, especially at the federal level, is too high. And it's events like this, and it's schools like Northwood University and organizations like ALEC that have to get the word out and be disciples of what made this country great, the American competitive free enterprise system and freedom in general. Finally, Kent mentioned the fact that we are so honored to put this together, and it's been the wonderful contribution of, uh, of Bob and Janice McNair and the McNair Foundation. I'd just like to say that uh, you know entrepreneurs are the cornerstone of this great country. Entrepreneurs have made this great country. They've helped build Northwood University. And um, we lost two great entrepreneurs since we were here last year. Uh, Dick DeVos, uh, Rich DeVos, I'm sorry, who was the founder of Amway, the, the son of a, a great human being in this room, Dan DeVos, the father of Dan DeVos, I should say. I'm getting a little emotional on this one. Uh, you know, we, we just need to pay tribute to the fact that these are among the greatest and the most decent people in this country, and they create the jobs in the marketplace that allows us to have the American dream. We lost Rich, and we also lost Bob McNair. Uh, at the end of November in 2018, Bob died after a 20-year battle with cancer, and um, he was a, uh, a great personal friend and, and one of the hallmarks in, in, in my life and in the history of this country as it relates to free enterprise and, um, and, and entrepreneurship. His dad never graduated from, uh, from high school, and. Uh, his dad worked his way up to be a regional manager for the Sunshine Biscuit Company, and Bob went from nothing to become a multi-billionaire and, and truly make this world a better place. So how about a round of applause for Mr. DeVos and, and Mr. McNair? Back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Tim. I've learned something today, and that is Tim is always right. So I will. Yeah, that will guide that will guide me in my journey. I do want to thank uh, Jonathan and uh, Tim for uh, sharing the stage and and presenting just fabulous and insightful information. Um, you know, as president of Northwood, I just think both of you, uh, as alum, reflect the Northwood idea, and uh, I thought it was just fascinating and. Um, I thank both of you. Uh, for everyone here, I want to uh, thank you for taking part in this. Um, 
You know, this is a, a very unique time. I talked briefly about it uh, last night. The last five years of my life have been spent uh, running another institution, but working extremely closely with a someone I consider a close friend, someone who we sp would speak every Saturday morning to other times uh, during the week. Uh, he's been considered one of the two top conservative prime ministers in the history of Canada, one of only four prime minister who's been uh, recognized as transforming uh, the country, and that's the 18th Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honourable Brian Mulroney. Um, and uh, on September 18th, we'll be opening something called the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government back in Canada. Uh, Northwood has had a 60-year head start uh, on, on these other institutions across Canada. Uh, the Mulroney Institute will be the only one of its kind. Uh, in the country, and it just this this session and this entire weekend has reminded me of the absolute need uh, and timely need for us to continue to develop young people who reflect the Northwood idea, who want to be entrepreneurs, who want to control their own lives and destiny and communities, and uh, and that was reinforced um, by the entire weekend us getting together, and in particular what I what I heard this morning. So. Uh, Tim, thank you. Uh, Jonathan, thank you. I look forward to seeing you on campus. I look forward to seeing all of you uh, here next year, and uh, thank you for your commitment to Northwood University. Thank you very much. <laughs>